exciting talk today by Mr. Carl Malamu. I think we've already circulated a you know, description of his bio and I'm not going to get into too many details. Uh, Carl's had, he's primarily a technologist, he's not a lawyer, but I think he knows more copyright law than uh, uh, most of us know on uh, the campus of Nalsar. He's been involved in some fascinating litigation in about two or three different continents, including in India before the Delhi High Court, on the issue of technical standards and uh, whether the government can uh, charge people for accessing the law. Uh, for those of you who studied administrative law would remember there was a very interesting case on uh, called Harla versus State of Rajasthan, which was on the issue of uh, whether a person could be held liable under a law that was never published. And in 1951, Justice Vivian Bose held that no. It was a law uh, to deal with, which was dealing with opium, and there was a conviction, and the Supreme Court said that since the law was never published by the government, uh, there was uh, no possibility for people to be aware of the law, and hence, hence they weren't convicted. So uh, Carl's talk raises similar issues on whether the government, whether the state should be charging people to access the law. It's a very fundamental issue which cuts across not only copyright law but also touches on constitutional law and administrative law. And uh, since he's been uh, engaged in a fascinating litigation in the Delhi High Court, he's in a position to give us a real insight into how this is playing out on the ground. Uh, so please join me in giving Carl a warm welcome and uh, I'll let him take the Uh, it's really nice to be here today. It's my first time in Hyderabad and I've been looking forward to uh, coming here. Uh, I spend pretty much every other month in India these days, so I'm here all of August. Uh, after this I'll be at Jodhpur Law School, I was at the Bangalore Law School. Um, I'll be here all of October, all of December. Um, so I'm going to talk today with a heavy focus on standards. And then I'm going to move on and kind of put that in perspective as to why I care so much about open access to these things. And so I'll talk about some of the other collections that we have here in India. I want to give you two caveats. Uh, so I was trained in economics. I got to the point of just about ready to finish my PhD around 1980. And I dropped out because computers seemed more interesting. In retrospect, I probably should have finished my PhD. Um, and so I have done computers for a living ever since. I'm self-taught, but you know, in the early days of computers, you taught yourself. Uh, read the manual is really the, the main rule. Um, I did a year in law school um, after I worked at the Indiana University Computing Center. I went to Washington, D.C. and worked for the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Um, I did Georgetown Law School for the first year. That was fascinating. I did con law, I did contracts, I did civil procedure, I did torts. I looked at my program for the second year. It was income tax, wills and estates, things like that, and I dropped out. Again, computers ended up eating up my career. Um, I spent the 80s writing computer books. I wrote a whole series of professional reference books about computer networks. Um, I was an early expert in databases, so I wrote one of the first books about Ingress, which was a relational database system. Um, ended up looking, uh, I was looking at computer networks in general, and you know, there were many different kinds of computer networks in the 80s. Uh, there was this international thing called Open Systems Interconnection, which was going to be the grand network that was going to rule them all. Uh, but there was this thing called the Internet Engineering Task Force, and I got involved with that, and we were building what now became the Internet. It was a few thousand people, but it's the protocols that ended up becoming the net that we're using today. And I am firmly convinced that the reason our network worked and the big fancy network that all the computer companies were trying to do called OSI didn't, is because our standards were open and it was all based on open source and no patents. And one of the things I've learned on the internet is there's always somebody smarter than you out there. And in the early days of TCP IP, which is what our current network is based on, when Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf came up with the transmission control protocol, TCP, it didn't work. There was a fundamental flaw. And there was a guy out in Berkeley that came up with a 12-line patch and all of a sudden the internet started working. And that was an important early lesson for me and it's kind of guided my, my um, 
my philosophy on, on why data should be open. Uh, in 1993, I started the first radio station on the internet. Um, and in those days, audio was very hard to do on the net. Um, you know, you tried to shove it through modems, and um, audio was big, and let alone video. And so that was things that we know about today as podcasting. Um, and of course, in the Internet Engineering Task Force, we would never have taken a patent out on anything like that. Uh, a few years later, somebody took out a patent on podcasting, and I'm glad that my lawyers at EFF were able able to beat that one back and get it revoked because I had been doing what they claimed was their original invention several years beforehand. Um, so that was in the 1990s and I was running a nonprofit. I wasn't part of the big dot-com boom. Uh, one of the things I did then is um, I was approached by a member of Congress about why the Securities and Exchange Commission database was not on the internet for free. And after a lot of discussion with the Securities and Exchange Commission, so these are all the reports of public corporations, right? If you, every, every public corporation like IBM, anyone on the stock market has to do an annual report and a quarterly report. When Google went public, they filed a report for their, their initial public offering. And in those days, it cost 20 or $30 to buy every one of these reports because the SEC had this system in which they worked with a vendor it was a $300 million contract or something like that. It was huge. And the vendors, in turn, added value. I don't know what that meant. But then they wholesaled the data to retailers like Disclosure and Dow Jones, and they, in turn, sold the data to people on Wall Street that could afford $30 annual reports. And when Chairman Markey approached me and said, well, you know, why isn't this on the Internet? I said, well, there's no reason it shouldn't be on the Internet. And so I managed to get a grant from the National Science Foundation. So um, track this one carefully. I took money from the American government to pay the American government for the data to give the data away to the American people. Now, the SEC thought that this was stupid because the only people that would care about this data were a few Wall Street fat cats. And why should we subsidize their free access? And lo and behold, uh, I had journalists and students and senior citizen investment clubs and all sorts of people were using it. Um, I ran the database for two years, had a pretty substantial user base. Um, and then I put a sign on the website that says, this service will terminate in 60 days. Well, we posted on the website all our source code. We had usage stats. We had our argument as to why it should be available, how much it costs. And at the bottom was a little click here to send mail to Al Gore, who was on the internet, and click here to send mail to Newt Gingrich, the Speaker of the House, who was on the internet, and click here to send mail to the Chairman of the SEC, who was not. So we sent up an email box for him. And we got 17,000 messages, which we printed out, brought down to the SEC, and the uh, Chairman of the SEC finally decided it was his job. Uh, they didn't know how to do it, and so we donated some computers. We loaned them computers. Um, these were all Sun Microsystems boxes. A guy named Eric Schmidt uh, was actually the guy who gave us the computers from Sun. He has gone on to be the chairman of Google. Um, and uh, we configured their internet line, we donated our source code, and we got them up and running. Um, so I did that in the 90s, and you know the internet really started to boom. A lot of my friends went off and started big companies. Um, and I, I took a, a quick run at, at dot com. I, I did that for a couple years, but I finally decided I was much happier running a nonprofit, which is what my radio station had been. Um, and so in 2007, I started a new nonprofit called Public Resource, and I decided to tackle the law because the law at the time was only available from Lexis and West, and you couldn't get, for example, Court of Appeals decisions on the Internet for free. And in the 90s, I had looked at the law, and it was just too hard. I, I just couldn't figure out how to do it. Uh, but I decided to go in and do that. So um, in 2008, uh, my friend Larry Lessig at Harvard, law Univer at Harvard University at the law school and myself um, raised $600,000, and we approached one of the vendors, that had all the Court of Appeals decisions, and we bought them, and we put them on the internet for free access. The entire back file, the Court of Appeals, and all the Supreme Court opinions. Um, and those became available, and those have now entered the ecosystem. Most of the Court of Appeals now have their opinions online, but because the back file was not available, as you know in the law, you need to look at precedent. 
Um, so those are now available, and there's a number of free law groups uh, that have made that data available. Uh, we took a run at the district courts. Uh, my young friend Aaron Schwartz and Steve Sch um, Schultz uh, downloaded a whole bunch of PACER documents from a public access site. Uh, the courts terminated the public access site, called the FBI on us, said that they were hacked. They weren't hacked. Um, and in fact, the FBI turned around and, and left. Uh, they said there's nothing to see here. Uh, the story made the New York Times, and the uh, courts called the FBI on us again. Um, and I found myself in an interrogation room with two FBI agents explaining why what I was doing was fine. Now, I had briefed the general counsel of the Senate committee that had oversight of the FBI before going in for the interview. Um, we also found numerous privacy problems in the district court opinions um, and the dockets. Uh, lawyers were very sloppy with uh, social security numbers, your equivalent to the ADHAR, but also names of confidential informants and names of minor children that were diagnosed with diseases and psychological problems that, that according to the rules, shouldn't have been in there. Um, our goal was to press for free access to PACER opinions. PACER is a system that has the district court dockets. Uh, we have lost on that one. Uh, and in fact, since I began looking at PACER, the price has gone up 25% and now cost 10 cents a page to access these things. Um, there's a very clever system called Recap out there, uh, which was developed at Princeton. And the way that works is when you pay 10 cents a page for a PACER document, it also uploads it to the Internet Archive. Um, that system has been taken over by courtlistener.com, and if you want U.S. District Court or appellate opinions, they do an amazingly good job of making that stuff available. Um, we did a few other things. Uh, I sent volunteers into the National Archives. We copied 6,000 videos. We threw them on YouTube. Uh, 75 million views. Uh, government video is an amazing resource. How to fix a Jeep, how electricity works, um, all sorts of great stuff. Agriculture. Um, we put all the nonprofit returns for the Internal Revenue Service online. That's about 9 million PDF files. And then sued the IRS over privacy violations because, again, they were very sloppy on allowing people filing public returns to also include Social Security numbers. They didn't have to do that, but people just thought it was a good thing. They put the name of their board of directors, their home address, and then their social security number in their, in their filings. And then they'd get all pissed off that their home address was available for public view. Well, these documents say on the very top, for public inspection. Uh, but despite that, the IRS was simply ignoring the problem. And like I said, I found 450,000 social security numbers in there and finally got the IRS to change their rules. So that's the kind of stuff we were doing at Public Resource. But the main focus, the thing that really struck my eye, um, so I looked at Court of Appeals opinions. I looked at our Federal Register. I, I helped the Obama transition revamp that. But there was one piece of the law that was not available. And that was building codes and electrical codes and fire codes. So in the United States, the way we do this is we have nonprofits like the National Fire Protection Association, and they develop model codes. And the model codes are developed by volunteers. Now, these are firefighters and engineers and professors that come together in meetings because they want fire safety or plumbing safety or electrical safety. And these codes are meant to be the law. And then they are incorporated by reference in the law. So the National Electrical Code is developed by the National Fire Protection Association. It is the law in all 50 states. All 50 states have incorporated this into law. And in fact, if you look at the National Electrical Code, there's an appendix. And the appendix is a sample notice of incorporation. It says, we, the people of, insert name of jurisdiction here, do hereby make this the law of the land. And there are criminal penalties if you're an electrician and you do things that are not conforming to the National Electrical Code, you lose your license and potentially you go to jail if what you did led to death, right? There's potential criminal liability. Despite that, copyright is asserted over these codes. Now, there was a 2004 decision called the VEC decision. Uh, Pete VEC. Uh, a guy in Texas decided the Texas building code needed to be available. So he bought the model code that Texas incorporates and he put it online and he got sued all the hell by the people that make the, the codes. 
and it went to the district court, guilty, went up to the Court of Appeals, and an en banc decision with Judge Jones, the chair of the Fifth Circuit, chief judge, very conservative judge, appointed by Ronald Reagan, they said that no, in the United States the law has no copyright, and perhaps the model code had copyright, but the Texas Building Code does not. This principle of edicts of government goes back to 1824 to a case, Wheaton v. Peters. And what happened in that case is there was a Supreme Court um, reporter, Mr. Wheaton, did a beautiful job reporting the Supreme Court. And then he stepped down, and Mr. Peters became the reporter of the Supreme Court. And Mr. Peters decided that because America was a new country and we had all these rural lawyers in log cabins, you may have heard of Abe Lincoln, um, couldn't afford those beautiful reports that Mr. Wheaton had put together and he wanted to do a cheaper version that had, maybe the margins weren't a big, as big and uh, the paper wasn't as nice, but they were a lot cheaper and he got sued by Wheaton. In this case of Wheaton v. Peters went to the Supreme Court. This was a very uncomfortable case because in those days, uh, the Supreme Court didn't have a building. They camped out in the basement of the Senate building, and they had a rooming house on Capitol Hill where all the justices and the reporters roomed. And so here we had this case in which one of the people they were living with was getting sued by one of the people that used to be their roommate. And it went to the Supreme Court, and there was a unanimous opinion that said in the law, uh, in the United States, the law has no copyright because the law is owned by the people. The people are the sovereign of the United States. Now that's not the case in the United Kingdom where the law is a crown copyright. But in the United States, Supreme Court opinions have no copyright. And a further set of decisions applied that to statutes and to regulations and to all other forms of the law. Now you may know of the works of government clause in the US. What that means is that works of the federal government have no copyright. Journal articles, opinions of judges, but states may assert copyright over their works, but the edicts of government doctrine says none of the law has copyright, no matter what the level is. So I bought the California Building Code, which is issued every three years. I spent $1,000. That's how much this thing costs. So it's, it's the, the entire set of codes for California. So it is the building code, electrical code, plumbing code, mechanical code, elevator safety code, fuel and gas code, right? And if you have a gas station, how do you pipe your gasoline? And the energy code, 1,000 bucks. I scanned it and I put it online. And then I took a deep breath and nothing happened. Nobody came to me. Now, I picked California for a couple reasons. For one, it is the state that asserts copyright over the California code. It is not the model code creators. But after looking at that, I went and I did the rest of the United States. I looked at every state's incorporation and I said, which code gets incorporated? I bought that code, I scanned it. So the National Electrical Code gets issued every three years. Some states are slower than others. We have three major plumbing codes. Some states have an early version of the plumbing code, some have a more modern version. So I had to go out and buy all the different versions of the various model codes. I put them online, including the fireworks safety code for the city of Las Vegas and the amusement park safety code for the city of Las Vegas. And on each one of them I put a cover sheet. Law of the land incorporated by, and I put the citation for at least one incorporation. I wanted to make it very clear that what I was posting was not the model code, it was the law. 2012, I began looking at the federal government. So at the federal government, there's a very elaborate process of incorporation by reference. If an agency wants to incorporate the ASTM code, American Society for Testing and Materials, for testing for lead in water, they have to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking. There is a public comment process. The incorporation has to be approved by the Office of the Federal Register, which has a series of rules, right? You, can, you can't just incorporate willy-nilly. Uh, you can't say, I'm gonna do the standard for testing for lead. You have to do a specific version, the 1983 version of the ASTM standard. And if you're incorporating just a subsection, you have to be very specific what it is you're doing, otherwise you're incorporating the entire standard. 
And so I went looking for that. Now these are really important standards. This is hazardous material transport. This is uh, safety of oil wells. Right? Remember we had an oil well that blew up in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and led to this incredible oil spill. Well, there are safety standards having to do for that. Uh, there are safety standards for personal protective equipment for firefighters. Uh, there are standards for safety of machines in, in factories. Um, and I found about a thousand of these standards. I went through the entire Code of Federal Regulations looking for the magic words incorporated by reference, approved by the Office of the Federal Register. Many of these standards were not available for sale because what happens is our government is slow. So there'll be a 1967 standard for welding safety on the books and it's no longer sold. American Welding Society has the current version for sale. And so I had to go on eBay and Amazon, right, looking for used copies. I had some friendly librarians. Now, in many libraries, you go in and, and look at these codes and say, I want to copy them, and the librarian says, uh, 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 copyright violation, you can't do it. The government has two copies of any of these standards incorporated by reference, available for public viewing, one at the National Archives and one at the government agency. So if you want to read the law, uh, and most libraries don't have these things because they simply can't afford them. You know, the standard for oil wells is a thousand dollar standard and no library is going to buy that. So if you want to read the law, the position of the government, the federal government, um, in many cases is sure, buy a plane ticket to Washington, come to the reading room. By the way, you need to give us three days notice because we're not sure where this thing is actually kept. And then if you come in, no Xerox machines. Uh, the Coast Guard said we couldn't even bring a camera in if we were going to read the law because, of course, we'd have to have permission. So I did about a thousand of these. Um, we, had, we got sued by the uh, sheet, metal, uh, sheet Metal and Air Conditioning Association over a totally obscure standard that, again, was not available for sale. And they had very bad lawyers, and they ended up settling with us. Uh, EFF represented me. Um, they even paid me a dollar symbolic fees, and they said, you can put our three standards incorporated into law available forever. Uh, their lawyer, they just weren't serious. And we had EFF, so e Electronic Frontier Foundation, and these people really know their stuff. Um, the next year, 2013, uh, the big suit came in. We got sued by the National Fire Protection Association, American Society of Testing and Materials, and the uh, uh, ASHRAE, American Society of Heating and Refrigeration Engineers, which does the energy codes. 450 standards were named in the suit, and it went to district court. Um, all my law firms, by the way, work for me pro bono, um, but district court litigation in the U.S. is horrendous. Um, in 2015, my pro bono legal bill was $2.8 million. Uh, we went through 23 days of depositions on this case. Uh, a second case came in right after the first one, three more plaintiffs. So it was two cases, six plaintiffs, four law firms on the other side. Uh, I don't know if you know what a deposition is like in, in U.S. litigation. Uh, three of the days were against me, so it's a 14-hour day. There's a court videographer, a court stenographer. The other side is six of their lawyers. My side is five lawyers, because we had Fenwick and West representing us as well as EFF. And the entire day consists of we had done discovery. Right, and I disclosed anything that mentioned the name of the plaintiffs in my email, any, anything that might be relevant, and we played that one by the book. Um, and so the day consisted of a piece of paper gets shoved across to the court stenographer who stamps it with a number, a copy goes to me, a copy goes to my lawyer, a copy goes to the other side's lawyers. Mr. Malamud, do you know what this piece of paper is? I said, well, it looks like it might be some email that I sent in 1998, at which point my lawyer goes, objection, don't speculate, we have no idea what this is. Uh, other side says, well, you know, and they object, and we finally concede that perhaps I might have sent this mail in 1998, at which point they say, would you read paragraph three? Now, what did you mean by that? entire day of that, 14-hour day. Um, they deposed the Internet Archive. We deposed, you know, all their people. 23 days of this stuff. And then we finally, when discovery closed, we went to the district court. So our argument was, this stuff is the law. 
That's one of the facts that everybody agreed on. Everybody agreed that every single standard I was being sued on had, in fact, been properly incorporated by reference. And when we got sued, I panicked a little bit. Because if it had not been incorporated by reference, I'm the first to concede the copyright's valid. Right? I would have violated their copyright, but, but I'd gotten it right. Um, there was one that I was a little worried about, and we, we did some in-depth research on that one, and so everybody agreed that every single standard was the law. And even the American National Standards Institute recognizes that standards incorporated by reference are the law, but the position of the standards development organizations are that, yeah, it may be the law, but you need permission from a private person to read it and certainly to speak it and to read it, especially. You sign a license, according to them, if you want to access particularly an electronic copy. And so our argument began with the Edicts of Government Doctrine. And we pointed to the Copyright Office Manual of Office Practice Procedures, uh, the, the compendium. It's got an Edicts of Government section. The law has no copyright in the United States. We pointed to this long uh, string of court decisions from the Supreme Court. We said, look, even if you don't buy edicts of government, we don't think the copyright's valid in many cases. Um, so many of these standards are authored by a thousand people. National Electrical Code has hundreds of authors. Many of them are federal government employees, right? Works of government, no copyright. It's a joint work. Maybe some private person has copyright. Not only that, in many cases, they didn't even get assignments on these things. So we, we, we argued that the copyright wasn't valid. We argued the merger doctrine. So in the US, copyright has to be a creative work. And if there's only one way to state a fact, there's no copyright in it. And we argued two things. One is there's only one way to state the law, right, the law. And more importantly, many of these standards are highly technical. They say if you install an electrical outlet, there needs to be another electrical outlet within three feet of it. And the reason for that is you don't want people stringing extension cords across the house. There's only one way to say three feet, right? And in fact, in our Court of Appeals uh, decision, one of the judges kind of leaned over and said, what are we supposed to say? More than two and less than four? Uh, <laughs> so that's the merger document. And then finally, we said fair use. So the fair use doctrine says that you can do anything you want in the United States. And if you get sued, you can say, well, this was fair. And there's four factors for fair use. One is whether you're commercial or non-commercial. Another is, what's, is it in the public interest? Uh, was it transformative? Did you transform the work into something new? And so there's these series of factors. District Court didn't buy any of them. She even said that we were commercial use. I, I run a 501c3 certified charity, a nonprofit. We have never sold intellectual property. In fact, I've got a weird thing in our bylaws that says we don't own intellectual property. If you want to take my logo and use it, I don't have a trademark on it. I don't assert copyright. We certainly don't have any patents. We've never sold anything. But the judge said, oh, well, but you get grants for doing this, and you get all this PR, and that's why you get the grants. Commercial use. Non-transformational. said, oh, all you did was scan these things. You scanned them and posted them. It's like, well, but your honor, we took hundreds of these and we retyped into HTML. Uh, we redrew the diagrams into SVG graphics so you can make them big and small and cut and paste them. We made them accessible to the visually impaired. We put them on the Internet Archive so you can actually find the things. And she said non-transformational. And so we lost. And there was an injunction put out against me. It was a trademark and copyright injunction. So it, the, the claim was that we had violated their trademark by having their name. Now, there's only one name for these standards, ASTM standard so-and-so, NFPA National Electrical Code. And I had actually thought about that. So in the US, the, the, the entire standard is incorporated by reference. And I wasn't going to, like, remove the logo because then I'm editing the law. And more importantly, if I had removed the logo, they would have been pissed off as well because they would have said, oh, you're passing this off as your own work. And what we told the judge is we don't care about trademark. If you want us to remove the logo, tell us to remove the logo. All right? We just did the entire standard was incorporated by reference. But she got us on, on, on a, tra a broad trademark injunction. Can't use the words at all. 
And so I had to remove like all reports that even mention ASTM and NFPA just to be safe because you don't want to screw around a federal judge. And 10 standards were named as being uh, under the injunction. And again, just to be safe, we removed anything from, from the Internet Archive and from my servers having to do with those. So I went to the Court of Appeals. Uh, Corinne McSherry is the legal director of EFF. She argued on my behalf. Uh, Andrew Bridges is one of the leading IP litigators in the United States. Uh, my lawyer for, for public resources, David Halperin, uh, he was Larry Tribe's law partner for Larry Tribe's Supreme Court practice. Um, he was also Greenpeace's lawyer. Uh, he was a speechwriter for Bill Clinton as well. Um, I knew him when I worked at the Center for American Progress for John Podesta for a couple of years, and we've become good friends. And so I had a crack legal team, and they argued the bright line rule. They went before the court and said, listen, this is a constitutional issue of free speech, the right to read and speak the law and inform your fellow citizens. And the judge kept saying, well, listen, are all these standards the law, and they started picking pieces of them, and we, we held our ground. We said, look, it, it is the law, if it's constitutional, and even if it's not that, it's got to be fair use. Now, we had a three-judge bench. We had Judge Wilkins, who was appointed by President Clinton. Um, Judge Wilkins uh, headed up the uh, Smithsonian uh, Afro-American Museum. Uh, he is, uh, was the plaintiff, he, so he was a district, he was a public defender for the District of Columbia, and he was driving in Maryland, uh, what we call driving while black, and he was pulled over by the police, and he brought a case with the ACLU, which was a landmark precedent that you can't do racial profiling when, when you're stopping people. Um, Judge Tattel, um, is blind, uh, amazing ju jurist, and, and he was the chief judge. Judge Katsis was the deputy general counsel for President Trump before he was elevated to the bench, and I think this may have been his first opinion. And so we got a 3-0 opinion uh, in our favor, uh, sort of in our favor, I'll explain why. Um, and what the court said is this, we understand that there's an important potential constitutional issue here, but we're not going to decide it because we think the district court could have decided this on fair use. So for example, they said this business about commercial versus non-commercial, that's basically nonsense because if you do that, every nonprofit is, is a commercial entity and there's just no meaning in that. Um, they went through a lot of the standards and said, well, this one sure looks like the law here. Um, and then they complained that the district court had simply did a, done a summary judgment and had not laid a proper paper trail had not opened up every standard and it says, what is this about? Was there market harm, right? They had just done a blanket rule. And so we've been remanded to the district court. The um, injunction has been lifted. Uh, uh, that will not take effect until 30 days uh, after the ruling if nobody appeals the Court of Appeals decision, right? So the other side may go for an en banc rehearing. And so until that gets settled, the injunction is in place. If in, within the next 10 days the other side or us don't file, um, then the injunction is listed, uh, lifted and at least in theory I can put those standards back online. In 2016, I measured how many hits we had denied, right, because people coming in trying to read the standards. I had had 5 million views that we had told people, you cannot read the law from us because we have an injunction. Um, so this was significant traffic. So this was sort of a victory. Um, as a friend of mine put it, this is like winning the pie eating contest and your prize is you get to eat more pie. And so we're going back to the district court. Uh, we're going to have a trial probably on 450 standards. I, I don't know. The judge may put them in different buckets and decide based on that. But at least in theory, we're going to open up 450 different standards and say, what does this mean? Was there market harm? Um, and then this will surely go back to the Court of Appeals one more time. Judge Katzis did a concurring opinion that said, in the unlikely event this is not fair use, I want to see this one again because it's in inconceivable that a person is not able to read the law. We had similar across the aisle kind of support in the U.S. Congress. Um, we had an amicus brief from two members of Congress. Uh, one was Daryl Issa, very conservative Republican. The other was Congresswoman Woman Lofgren. And they filed an amicus brief saying the law must be available. We had a dozen uh, 
federal employees, including the former director of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, former Secretary of Labor, uh, John Podesta, former Chief of Staff of the White House, the guy who was Executive Director of the Office of the Federal Register for 18 years signed an amicus brief on our side. Two public printers of the United States signed um, an amicus brief. Every library association in the United States. Uh, we've had groups like the ACLU and others support our efforts. The other side, their amicus briefs were the American Medical Association, the American Insurance Association, the International Trademark Association, the American Dental Association. I don't know why they have a uh, ax to grind on this one. Uh, so this is a fairly um, uh, prominent case. And so we got another couple years on that one. When I posted the US standards, I started looking around the world. And I did a real deep dive into the European Union. Now what happens in the EU? is the European Union goes to the uh, Centre for European Normalization, CEN, and they give them work orders. They say, we want standards in these areas and standards in those areas. Now, CEN is, is also a non-governmental organization, but they're funded by the EU. And CEN comes up with these standards. The national standards bodies of each European country are members of CEN, and they have outside experts. And they come up with a standard it is then noticed in the European journal, and every country in Europe has six months to transcribe it into national law, right? To say this is a binding standard. And so I had posted a whole bunch of standards, and I started getting grief from like Bulgaria, cut me off. I wasn't able to buy any more standards from them. Uh, France, there's actually a Conseil d'Etat um, decision that says the law must be available. And so the French Standards Organization actually makes standards available. Uh, the Germans were not amused. And they sued me, the German National Standards Organization, DIN, uh, sued me for the European Safety Standard for Baby Pacifiers. Soothers, you know, the thing that you suck for the babies. And the standard actually is, is a reasonable one. It says that the, the rim of, of the baby pacifier needs to be big enough that the baby doesn't swallow it. If there's pellets in there that rattle, they should be on the outside, not on the part that the baby sucks, because the baby will chew through it and swallow the pellets. So it's some very reasonable safety things. And so we went to the German court and they said, no, it's copyright. And we appealed. I said, no, 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 it's copyright. Um, and we tried two things. We said, listen, uh, there had been an Irish Supreme Court case about concrete standards, and they had gone to the European Court of Justice for an advisory opinion. They said, if this was noticed in the official journal of the European Union, does it have the force of law? And the European Court of Justice said, yes, it did. So we pointed that out to the German court of second instance. The other thing we discovered is that the reason standards have copyright in the Copyright Act of Germany is the standards body had drafted some draft legislation and had gotten it through parliament. And it was a law for one person, right? The German Standards Organization. And you can't do that. Laws have to be laws of general applicability. But this one really was basically you know, asserting that their stuff was private property. And we pointed that out, and the Germans just, we, I, we lost. Uh, we could have brought it one more level, but the, the second level decision was race judicata, right? It was final. So we could have gone to the next level up and said the finding of race judicata was incorrect and appealed that. That didn't look like a really good way to go. Uh, Morrison and Forrester handled that case for us. Um, we're going back into Europe. This was a, f a, a few years ago we, we were convicted. By the way, there is a personal injunction out against me. If I were ever to post the European baby pacifier standard, it's a 250,000 euro fine, and if I can't pay, the pers person of the president shall be seized for one to two years of administrative detention, which means jail. So needless to say, I have not reposted that standard. Um, there is a special European Union regulation having to do with environmental information. And anybody, including a non-resident, can petition the EU for environmental information. And if it is turned down, you can go straight to the European Court of Justice. You don't have to walk up through the national. Um, so I have retained an Irish lawyer simply because the, the, the decision uh, from the ECF was, was there. Um, and we're going to petition the European Union for toy safety standards about like chemicals in toys and a few others. 
and they might turn us down, and at which point we will then try to decide whether or not we're going to bring suits. So we're, we're kind of beginning the process all over again in Europe. All right, India. I was, uh, as I began doing the international standards, I went to see my friend Anish Chopra, who was Chief Technology Officer of the United States. He had been appointed by President Obama. And, you know, because I worked for Podesta, I, I knew all those folks. And it was a courtesy visit. He had just taken office. And it's, hi, hi Anish, congratulations. Uh, you know, anything I can do. And he goes, so what are you doing? And I explained what I was doing with standards, which is nothing he could help me with from the White House. Um, particularly given that when they first went into office, they had two wars, a financial meltdown, the Republicans attacking them. You know, they weren't going to pick an issue like this. Uh, but I said, you know, Anish, I'm thinking of doing India. He goes, oh, really? Well, you need to meet my counterpart in India, Sam Petroda, who's working for Manuel Ham Singh. And then he pauses and he goes, well, he's not really my counterpart. When we had the summit meeting, there was Manmohan Ham Singh on one end of the big table, and there was Obama on the other end of the table, and Anish Chopra was like in a seat way in the back of the room with the other aides. Sam Petroda was right next to Obama. So he was a CTO of the country, but he was a cabinet minister. And as you may know, he was a cabinet minister under Rajiv Gandhi with, I believe, three portfolios. He told me once he had 11 million employees reporting to him when he worked for Rajiv Gandhi, because he had three ministries that he was doing. And of course, what Sam did, um, he went to see Indira Gandhi in the early days. And he said, you know, I believe there should be a telephone in every village. Sam invented one of the early digital PBXs. And he could have come to Mumbai and done, you know, telephones for big corporations. But he thought it was more important to do this. So he had actually petitioned for a meeting with Indira Gandhi. And he got a note back, Prime Minister's office, saying you can have 10 minutes with the Prime Minister. And this is Sam Petroda. He sent a note back and said, no, I can't do it in 10 minutes. I want an hour. And three months later, he got another note saying, OK, you got your hour. And he said, you know, I want to put a village, a, a telephone in every village in India. And he did. And it was the beginning of the telecommunications revolution. So I went to see Sam. Um, and I said, Petrodigy, I'm, you know, I explain standards. And he's like, well, why are these copyrights? I said, well, they, they want the money. And this is how they do it all over the world. And he said, well, you know, what are these about? And I said, well, in India, this is the National Building Code of India. This is 150 standards that have mandatory certification. If you want to sell steel or cement in India, you have to have it stamped, certified by the Bureau of Indian Standards. And the standard is what governs what gets certified. Um, by the way, interesting point. Bureau of Indian Standards is a government body here in India, unlike these private NGOs in the rest of the world. Less than 2% of their revenue comes from the sale of standards but they assert strong copyright on these things. And so I told Sam, I'm thinking of putting these on the internet. And he goes, well, th this is good. You should do this. And I said, well, Sam, the Bureau of Indian Standards is going to be very annoyed. And he goes, I don't care. And so I put all 19,000 standards on the internet. Um, we took about 900 of them, and we retyped them into HTML. Now, if you're an engineering student in India, and there's over 600,000 engineering students, every one of you has to read the National Building Code. And what they were doing is there would be one CD in the library, and they'd go stand in line, and they'd pull this thing up. Because the way that the Bureau um, sells these things is they either sell them as a printed book, National Building Code of India costs 14,000 rupees. That's a lot of money for a book in India. Or they sell these CDs that have digital rights management wrapped around the PDF files, right? And so I spent $5,000 and I bought the subscription. And I, I got rid of the DRM because that was stupid. And I put it online for free access. Uh, about 900 of them got retyped into HTML, SVG graphics, accessible to the blind wildly popular with engineering students, with government officials. There was an interministerial task force on disaster preparedness for the union government. I heard this from somebody. Um, and uh, all the, you know, these are joint secretaries and principal secretaries. And somebody stood up and said, you know, we should all have a copy of the building code. And the bureau stood up and said, well, that'll be 14,000 rupees each, and you'll have to sign a license agreement. And let alone being a building inspector for the city of Mumbai, right? Or being the headmaster of a school, and you look at your fire exits, and you go, I wonder if those are right. You ought to be able to pull these codes up. But it's more than the mandatory certification and the building code. It's standards for irrigation. It's standards for uh, safety of textile machines. Again, personal protective equipment for firefighters. 
Now, the way these standards are developed, there is a governing council. And the governing council consists of two union ministers, five state ministers, two members of parliament, and a whole list of joint secretaries, principal secretaries, additional secretaries. And they're the governing council. There are 14 divisions, right, like electro-technical division, food and agriculture safety division, and many of those are chaired by government employees. There are 650 committees that develop the Indian standards, and in many cases, um, these are government employees doing them, and if they're not government employees, they're professors or they're engineers, and they all volunteer their time. Nobody gets paid to write standards. The standards come up in draft. There is a, a period of public comment right, for the drafts. They are then approved as Indian standards, and they are noticed in the official Gazette of India. So I thought to myself, these are the law. They really are. And even if they're not incorporated into regulations, there are several hundred that are part of state regulations and, and you know, Department of Ministry of Steel or Ministry of Food. They, they use these standards in their regulations. Even the ones that are not are the best codified knowledge of the best experts in the country as to how to keep a textile machine safe or how to keep water free of pesticides. So it's important knowledge and developed through an intense governmental process. So after about a year of my subscription, I got the renewal notice from the Bureau. And it's important when you do this kind of work that you, you do it in an upfront fashion. Remember before Gandhi marched to the sea, the first thing he did was send a letter to the Viceroy saying, we're going to make salt, right? And then he marched to the sea. And so I sent a letter back to the Bureau saying, well, of course, I would love to renew. Here's my purchase order. And by the way, here's all your standards on the internet. 900 of them are now in HTML. Would you like the HTML? We'd love to give it to you. And I got this anguished letter back. Uh, this whole thing is online, if you want to look at the letters. Um, got an anguished letter back uh, from the sales manager. Copyright violations. We're cutting you off. Cease and desist. You must stop. And so the way you do these things, um, we petition the Honorable Ministry of, of Food, Consumer Affairs, and something else. And we put together a very intense petition that had lists of all the state regulations that use the standards. And it had before and after pictures of what the standards looked like when we bought them and how they looked after we transformed them. Uh, lists of all the standards on mandatory certification affidavits from distinguished professors of water engineering and transportation engineering in India. Sam Petroda was out of government by the time. He had an affidavit. Vince Sir, father of the internet, had an affidavit. And we sent this up to the ministry, and you know, a few months later we got turned down. So, next step, public interest litigation. Uh, the firm of Nishith Desai and Associates out of Mumbai, very, very prominent corporate law firm, and uh, Salman uh, Khurshid, uh, former Minister of Law and Justice. Uh, he is our senior advocate. We are in front of the Honorable uh, High Court of Delhi. Uh, we have oral argument on October the 9th. So we've been through a couple instances of oral argument. We had sued both the union government and the bureau. And what happened is the union government failed to um, answer. And so we kept getting adjourned and, you know, the, the, a new deadline was given and the union government wouldn't wouldn't respond. And there was one time in court in which a lawyer stood up for the government and the acting chief justice leaned over and said, are you here for BIS or for the union government? And the lawyer <laughs> said, I don't know. And so he was sent back to figure out who his client was and court was adjourned. And so it, it only took a couple of years until we actually got to oral argument. We almost were there. Um, Salman was in court. Um, the case before us was a gentleman suing his 70-year-old widowed mother to evict her from the house. Her husband had died in service to the country in the military. She was in court crying. He was in the back of the room. The Chief Justice called him up to the front. Um, his position was that because she had not contributed any income, that somehow she was not entitled to the property and she just laid into this gentleman asking him, you know, didn't she feed you? Didn't she take care of you? Did you go to college? Uh, yes, your ladyship, I have a college degree. Um, and this case went on and on and she turned at one point and said, oh, Mr. Kershaw, I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. And he stood up and bowed and said, your ladyship, I'm of course pleased to 
I mean, I'm at your disposal. And so he stood up for about five minutes and said, this is about the law. And the other side said, well, you know, the law's available, you just have to pay for it. At which point the chief justice kind of like gave him a bunch of grief. And then it was lunchtime, court adjourned, and so we didn't get our oral arguments. So we're back in on, on in October for this thing. Uh, we're hopeful. We're hopeful. You never know what a judge will decide. Um, you know, it may be that they look at the Standards Act and say copyright is valid. Uh, it may be that they buy our argument that it's the law. But um, we'll find out. We've got a number of other um, things in India. Uh, one time when I went to see Sam, he, he was on his laptop and he goes, well, do you have a stick, Carl? I wasn't familiar with that. And I said, what? USB drive. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I gave it to him and we talked for a while and uh, he handed me back the USB drive and I said, what is this? Collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, all 100 volumes, new electronic edition. It's in beta. I'm like, well, Sam, where'd you get it? Sabarmati Ashram. Uh, so what are they going to do with it? Well, they're going to put it on a website. And I said, well, can I do anything with it? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. And again, I was like, won't the ashram be annoyed? He said, no, nah, it's the works of Gandhi. And so since I had the collected works of Gandhi up on the Internet Archive, I went looking around government servers. I found 129 audio files of Gandhiji speaking on All India Radio, 1947, 1948. And so I put those on the archive and I was able to extract the English translation of his speeches and turn them into HTML. So you can listen to the speech, you can see the English translation, and at the bottom the footnotes are live. And so you can click back into the collected works and you can see what letters he wrote that day, what letters he wrote the next day, and you can literally walk through the last year of that amazing life of his. Uh, we found many volumes of the works of Nehru on a government server but they were missing nine volumes, and so I bought those and scanned those as well. So we have the most complete um, selection of, of the, the complete works of Nehru. Uh, same thing with Ambedkar. Um, I have been going to the publications division every time I'm in Delhi. I go there and I buy about 100 pounds of books. Publications division does amazing publications. They have a 50-volume series of the builders of modern India. Uh, they have books on uh, the lamps of India, how to wear a sari. The, they have uh, uh, commentary on, on religious figures. They have the temples of India. They have the, the churches of India. They have the, the Jain temples of India. All these books, many of them with beautiful photographs. And I've been going ahead and posting those as well as Archaeological Survey of India. And my feeling is that those are, are public works. Those are works of government, if you will, uh, funded with public money, uh, meant to be available. Uh, we are using these on a non-commercial basis. Um, so that's what I call the Hind Swaraj collection. Um, we have, uh, I'm working with Sushant Sinha from Indian Kanoon. Uh, we have been mirroring all the gazettes of India. Um, they're on various state sites. Now, not all states have their gazettes online. Uttar Pradesh, we can't find it. 250 million people in UP, but we can't find their gazette online. But many of the other states do have them online, but they're not searchable. They're very hard to access. Um, <coughs> they're very hard to download in bulk because it's, it's this weird Microsoft code. Some of them have captures. Right, so before you can actually read the Gazette, you have to type in this thing. And so Sushant's been writing the code and I've been exercising the code. We have about 300,000 PDF files online now. And we're beginning the process of embedding fonts, uh, trying to do OCR on these things, looking inside them. Um, municipal codes for various uh, municipalities are not readily available. Many of them are published in the state Gazettes. And so we're trying to figure out how to dig inside of these things and, and pull out and compile things like municipal codes. Um, a project, by the way, uh, many of these states, we have no idea where their codes are, uh, where, where their gazettes are. We need law students to go knock on the door of like the Gazette of Uttar Pradesh and ask them some questions like, excuse me, do you sell CDs or DVDs and what is the date range? Can I just get them going forward or do you have them historically? Is there a repository of all your gazettes? Because presumably they send a copy to various places. Um, just try to figure out what the inventory is. And so we've got some students down at National Law University, Bangalore, that are sort of interested in doing this. It's their Law and Tech Society. But, you know, India's a big place. Um, it's an easy little project, right? It'd take a few hours of your time. You just got to go down to the Gazette office, maybe when you're on vacation in your home state, 
um, and, and just knock on the door and, and ask some questions and you know they may they may not answer you. They may say, well, why do you want these? Uh, but it would be nice to know who asserts you know, ownership over them and who simply makes them available and where are they. Um, so that's an interesting little project. The, the big one we're doing is something called Sci-Hub. So I, 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 have you folks read the, the piece I did in The Wire? Um, so Sci-Hub is, is a pirate site in Russia. Um, Alexandra Elkaben uh, was a graduate student in science and got very frustrated because she couldn't access the scholarly literature. She needed to do her research. And so she put this site together, um, which has um, seven core PDF files in it. It is all human knowledge if you're a scientist. It, it's really quite amazing. <laughs> Uh, she is being sued all the hell. She was sued in the Southern District of New York. $15 million judgment out against her. Court orders trying to remove her domain names. Um, I looked at the Delhi University copy shop case. Um, that was a case um, at Delhi University in which students uh, were able to buy course packs. And the, 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 the court's decision was that because this was uh, under the teaching exemption under copyright law in India, this was a teacher giving a student materials in the course of their instruction. The copy shop was a commercial operation, but it was there at the invitation of the university. They would go to the library, copy the articles, and sell them. Uh, the copy shop was raided by armed police because Cambridge and Oxford Presses sued them. Uh, people like Lawrence Liang and Shamnad Bashir intervened on behalf of the students and the teachers. And the ruling was that this felt, uh, fell under the teaching exemption. Um, now, that, that is not um, race judicata, if you will. It was a beautiful opinion that was written. But at the end of the day, it went up. It went back down. The publishers dropped their suit. Um, so it, it is not final law, but it, it, it's an interesting opinion. And it opened my eyes a little bit. Um, so I looked at Sci-Hub. And I had a copy of Sci-Hub in the United States that I had made, and I used it because I was looking for journal articles written by federal employees or officers in the course of their official duties. And I had seen an article by President Obama that was on the Harvard Law Review site. And Harvard Law Review was essentially asserting copyright. They said, well, the words of the president are not copyright, but the distinctive layout and feel of the Harvard Law Review is copyright. And therefore, this article is copyright. So they were claiming there was this veneer of copyright around the president's words. And despite, um, excuse me, I used to be in radio, so if I knock off the windscreen, I need to put it back on. Um, <laughs> um, and so I did a study. Um, and, you know, it, it is okay to use resources such as Sci-Hub for non-commercial transformational purpose, in my case, data mining, looking for works of government. I found 1.2 million journal articles by federal employees. Now, the, the question was, is it in the course of their official duties? Um, so we pulled 6,000 of those articles out and did a manual examination. In almost every case, copyright was being asserted. We also looked for clues in the biography. Did it say, I work for the Federal Communications Commission, but I did this when I was a student? Well, that's no longer in the course of your official duties, right? You, you didn't do it while a government employee. In other cases, it's the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission thanking his attorney advisors for their assistance on writing this article. And it's something like antitrust enforcement priorities for the upcoming year pretty clearly in the course of the official duties. And I actually did a legal analysis of the, the um, works of government doctrine in the United States and how it had been interpreted by the courts. But what I found as a general rule was that, that most publishers were asserting copyright over works. And in many cases, I couldn't tell if it was uh, um, in the course of official duties because I don't have the copyright release form. I don't know whether or not they did it in the official duties. So rather than taking those 1.2 million articles and just throwing them on the internet, um, I looked at it and I just thought to myself, I, I just don't know how to attack this. But because I had been doing increased work in India, it occurred to me that perhaps Sahib might fit in some limited fashion under the teaching exemption under Indian copyright law. And if not under the teaching exemption, under the other aspects of the right to education, which is firmly enshrined 
in the Indian Constitution. Um, there are doctrines of uh, antitrust law of essential facilities, for example, that state under certain circumstances copyright does not apply. And so I um, took a big gulp. I took 16 8 terabyte disk drives and put them in a little suitcase about the size of my briefcase but it weighed 19 kilos and I carried it with me on the airplane and I brought it to India and I locked it away. A very safe location. And I made a point of going on the wire with an op-ed and to say, I'm not here to build another pirate site. Right? I'm not going to do that. I am here to discuss the issue with vice chancellors and lawyers and professors and scientists and understand is there a way under Indian law that rather than forcing 20 million university students in India to go to a pirate site in Russia that we can provide this material to them so that they can have their education done properly and so they have access to the material. And just as importantly, so that big data research can be done on the scholarly corpus, right? Today, there, it is impossible to analyze all 70 million journal articles to ask questions like, do scientists in different professions write differently? Or are the metrics used to judge the importance of scientific articles valid or not? Or was there plagiarism done? Or other useful things that you might need the entire corpus in order to do the work? And so that is locked away, um, but I think it's very important. Um, so in, in closing, I, I want to explain a little bit about why I'm doing this and why I think this is so important. So Gandhiji did more than the liberation of India. He helped decolonize the world. He set an example that led to Africa and all the other colonies declaring independence. Today, knowledge has been colonized and commoditized, partly because of the TRIPS agreements. Uh, knowledge is very much a commodity being sold by, uh, by very rich corporations. Reed Elsevier has about half of the journals in the world. Uh, they have a 40% gross margin on their scientific publishing arm, which is greater than Google's gross margin. It is obscenely rich. Um, they are extracting huge fees. Um, to me, scientists are the new indigo farmers who are taking raw materials. Journals are the new railroads in which those raw materials are being shipped, ironically enough, to the United Kingdom. And you are forced to buy these very high-priced finished goods. To me, Sci-Hub is an unlicensed salt factory on the edge of the ocean of knowledge. Read Elsevier, if you, don't, if you have a package, right, you get certain journals, but if you're a scientist and you need a particular article that's not in your package, they will charge you $5,000 for a single journal article. It's very much an abuse of monopoly power. Um, as I mentioned with works of government, they're asserting copyright over materials that they don't have copyright. Uh, there are materials that are in the public public domain because the copyright registrations were not renewed. There was a study at the University of Pennsylvania for periodical renewals prior to 1963. In the United States, you had to renew your copyright. The vast majority were not renewed. And so there's this entire body of works that is not available. There is uh, many universities, not just in India, but even in the United States where you cannot access the materials you need. When we pulled those 6,250 articles out for manual examination, uh, we were using the University of North Carolina library system. It was a school of libraries. They were unable to pull out at least 60 of those articles. They simply didn't have access. Even Harvard is cutting back on journals. And so I believe this is an important situation. And I believe that access to knowledge is every generation has something they can do. And I think in our time, access to knowledge is a great promise that's before us. Now, you may say that there are much more important problems in the world, right? There is global warming and global warming denial. Our president in the United States doesn't believe there's global warming. In India, we're really not doing a lot about global warming. There is rampant pollution. There is a food surplus in India and 200 million people dying of hunger. But at the end of the day, it's important to remember that we own our government. And in a democracy, an informed citizenry is the key to that democracy. 
And if you ask yourself, is there going to be a revolution in access to knowledge, I've come to the conclusion that it's going to have to start in India. That India has to set the example that decolonizes information, not just for India, but for the world. It's not going to happen in the United States. It's certainly not going to happen in Europe. I, I believe in India with a long tradition of access to knowledge, a distrust of things like $1,000 pills, right? expensive intellectual property, $1,000 technical standards that might save lives, uh, a long tradition of talking through difficult problems ranging from the Buddhist councils all the way to the present day. Um, I believe India is the place where that revolution might happen. It's why I'm spending the next two years focusing pretty much exclusively on India. I'm continuing the edicts of government fight in the U.S., uh, but I'm spending more than half my time in India working on these various collections. So thank you very much. I'd be more than happy to take questions. Surely I said something that must be questionable. <laughs> so I, I had a couple. I mean, given that Saurabh and me are teaching copyright law and you just made uh, copyright law to be the bad boy in the room. Uh, if you go back to Gandhi, there's this uh, famous article that Sham Krishna Bal Ganesh has written on Gandhi it's a and beautiful copyright article. law. Yeah. yeah. It would have been half the size that he wrote it of, but it's still, it's still a lovely article. We circulated in class. And Gandhi surprisingly liked his copyrights because, no, let me finish. And, and finish your question. Finish your question and then I'll correct you. This is especially <laughs> relevant in the fake news era yeah. because one of his uh, fears with his, you know, giving up the copyrights in his articles was that he was worried that they would be translated uh, inaccurately into other languages. And this is an issue that we've seen consistently that has been raised by authors in India. Because India is one of these uh, jurisdictions where translations count for a large portion of the revenue. So Gandhi saw copyright law as a means of, uh, you know, being able to control his translations. And while I agree that a lot of the issues that you've raised are relevant, but don't you think a lot of those issues also have to do with the fact that there are monopolies in the publishing industry, which perhaps uh, antitrust or competition law could deal with more effectively than eroding away at the basics okay. of copyright? So a couple points. Um, first of all, I have no objection to copyright. And I actually told the president of the National Fire Protection Association, I don't care if you have a copyright. I want to be able to read and speak the law. So if he had simply said, fine, we have copyright but Creative Commons license, right? Attribution required. I got no problem with that. Gandhi's views, as in many of Gandhi's views, evolved over time. So he didn't want bad translations of his autobiography to come out. And that's when he asserted copyright. On the other hand, when he was at Phoenix, he was taking stuff from all over the place. And you know his version of bread labor in the old, early days was not spinning cotton. Uh, the first thing they did when they started the Phoenix Ashram is they took the printing press um, and they put it on ox carts with 16 oxen and they hauled that thing into the wilderness. And before they built houses for themselves, they were camping outdoors, they built a house for the printing press. And everybody at Phoenix had to print every day, um, including Gandhi, who was an awful typesetter. Um, but, but he was very much a printer and uh, he, was, he would take stuff from all over and reprint it in his publications. So he felt very strongly that it was important to get information out and in today's world he, he would have been, been um, making liberal use of fair use, let me put it that way. Um, on the other hand, he thought very it was very important to preserve the integrity of his works, uh, particularly against fake versions of his work. Um, so perhaps, um, I, I think he would have had uh, 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 complicated opinions uh, about copyright in today's day and age. I think he would have been aghast by fake news. Um, I know Sam Petroda has said he would have been an avid Twitter user in today's world. Um, but that, that paper is worth reading because it shows his views evolving over time. He would assert copyright sometimes, and at other times he just didn't care. 
Um, so he, he used it to protect the integrity of his works and perhaps moral rights or, or something of that sort are, are more appropriate um, to, to take care of that. But again, I don't care about copyright. I just want to be able to make publicly funded materials available for people to use. Again, I don't care if the government has copyright. And I think it's particularly important that people be able to not only read the law freely, but to re-express the law to inform citizens in a better way. And so those are the things that I care about the most. And if copyright comes with that, I don't care. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. okay. Then. So uh, thanks, Carl. It was great having you over. He's going to be here for another 10, 15 minutes if anybody wants to speak to him offline. Uh, so you're free to do that. But otherwise, thank you for taking the time out to come to Nalsar and uh, giving this uh, lovely talk. My and pleasure. Sure thank you very much. Be in touch with By the way, I am uh, Carl at media.org. Um, if you want my book, uh, Code Swaraj, public.resource.org slash Swaraj. That's the book I wrote with Sam. And needless to say, with a name like Code Swaraj, no rights reserved. Um, so you can buy it on Amazon if you want, but you can just download it. And, and, and we have it in EPUB version. Uh, Hindi version's done. Uh, Urdu version will be done soon. Uh, Gujarati, Punjabi, uh, all the other Indian languages are on their way. So we're, we're going to have this in 11 languages. So thank you.